themselves into a, a well-behaved hush. I will take that as my, as my cue to get us started. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us this morning. Are we are we streaming to? Yep, we are. Thanks to everyone online as well for following us. So um, just so everybody is aware, you are broadcasting live to the internet um, to our, our, our millions and millions of YouTube followers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but hopefully, uh, hopefully you are. You can see the thing behind me. You're in the right place. We are here to uh, present some uh, new research, um, or give you a snapshot of some research that uh, Rob has been doing with us at the Social Market Foundation. Um, thank you to UK and Changing Europe as well for sponsoring the event and the research. Um, looking at education and the dividing line in British politics. So, how? have um, people with different levels of education, how have their social and political attitudes changed, how has that led through to their voting behaviour uh, and political alignments, and what are the implications for our politics and policy beyond. Um, so uh, just a, kind of a couple of bits of housekeeping. As I say, we are broadcasting live to the internet. For those of you who enjoy tweeting, um, please tag us in at SMF Think Tank at UK and EU or hashtag LDConf. Um, in, in case of fire, uh, follow the green signs with the guy running away from a fire. That, that should keep you right. Um, but other than that, uh, just, just in terms of format, um, I'll have about five minutes from Rob just presenting his research, which, as I say, is a preview of a piece of work that's going to be coming out later this autumn, um, from uh, which published under, under the SMF banner. Um, we will have a uh, five minutes contribution from Miranda and a quick response from Jane as well um, before opening up to wider discussion. Without further ado, um, to kick us off, I am going to ask Professor Rob Ford, Professor of Political Science at the University of Manchester, to summarise what he's been looking at and all these found so far and can frame our discussion. Uh, thanks, Vic. Um, so um, I'm going to give you a very quick whistle-stop tour through some of the main landmarks, la main landscape points with regards to this education divide that is opening up in British politics. So landmark one, here is the pattern of conservative support in terms of university graduates in light blue and school leavers. So that's people who have GCSE qualifications or less. And you will see that before the 2016 EU referendum, those two groups supported the Conservatives at roughly similar levels. And if we project backwards 40 years, that's true for most of the period before that as well, all the way to 1979. After the EU referendum, support amongst school leavers increased to a majority in every single period that the British Election Study has surveyed. This is from the British Election Study Internet Panel. With the exception of that slightly chaotic period at the end of Theresa May's uh, period as PM when we briefly had four party politics and everyone got very excited and uh, things went back to the way they were before. For Labour, it's not almost but not quite a mirror image. The difference here is that the education divide opens up about a year earlier when Jeremy Corbyn becomes Labour leader and you'll see that university graduates support Labour at much higher rates in every single wave of the British election study uh, since that time. And again, if we go back in time, here we do see an education divide in the past, but it's the opposite. Uh, it used to be that school leavers supported Labour at much higher rates than university graduates. So this is actually an inversion of what we have seen in the past. For the Lib Dems, an education divide is actually not such a novelty. Uh, for as long as the party has existed, they've done better amongst university graduates than uh, amongst school leavers. And indeed, political scientists will tell you one of the only things that reliably predicts Lib Dem support in terms of national demographics, because the party is so heterogeneous and, and localised, is uh, education. Uh, always has done. Uh, true also of the Lib Dem's predecessors, uh, the Liberals. So the EU referendum did kind of increase that divide a little bit. And again, you can see that kind of glorious slash chaotic period when the Lib Dem surged to about 25% in the polls before things kind of went back to the status quo ante. Now, there's a dash line in here everywhere saying EU referendum because Brexit was and is one big driver of these education divides. 
even before the referendum itself, education was the strongest demographic predictor of what people thought about the EU. Since the referendum, it has remained the strongest demographic predictor of Brexit voting preferences, Brexit identities, Brexit policy preferences, everything. The Brexit divide is an education divide first and foremost. But that is not the only thing that education predicts. Education also predicts a wide range of social identities. This chart here shows you national identities. The, the, the solid line here is the average score. Graduates tend to identify less with every form of British national identity. Britishness, Englishness, Scottishness, Welshness. Graduates don't tend to have a very nationalized sense of themselves. School leavers tend to identify very strongly with each form of national identity offered. The only exception to this pattern is European identity, which is much weaker than every form of national identity and is primarily popular with university graduates. Education also very strongly predicts social values, in particular, liberal social values. So graduates are less likely to support the death penalty. They're less likely to think schools should teach children to obey authority. They're less likely to support censorship or stiff censorship for lawbreakers and stuff. These items, instead, if you're wondering, is this like a random set of opinions that uh, I'm just interested in uh, what people think about? This is what's called the, the liberal authoritarian core values scale. It's something that academics have used for 40 years. Recently, the British Social Attitude Study did a report on 40 years of attitude change and found that we as a society have become more liberal on basically all of these kinds of values. And in all of these cases, it is graduates that are kind of in the vanguard of that social change. And very critically for where we are in politics right now, uh, education also predicts political priorities. So when we look at the politics of immigration, it's a politics that exercises people who left school at the earliest opportunity. School leavers, those with few formal qualifications, are much more likely to emphasize immigration. Indeed, it was the number one issue on the agenda for them in the years running up to Brexit, whereas for graduates, it was way down the list. Interestingly, there is an issue that shows the exact mirror image pattern to that, and it is the environment, where uh, it is graduates who emphasize this as a political priority, and school leavers who do not really see it as an issue that's particularly a burning question for them. So if you are a party that has recently been struggling with graduates and you were thinking about what issue to place on the center of the agenda, then I would probably say to you, don't by any means start getting into a big fight about climate change. Yet that is exactly what the conservatives have chosen to do. Now, all of this is very important longer run because our electorate is changing longer run. If we go back 20 years to the 2001 census, two thirds of the electorate were people who left school at 16 or younger with GCSE level qualifications or less. And only a fifth of the electorate had university degree. Fast forward 20 years and we are now over a third of voters having a university degree and 40% having uh, GCSE level qualifications or less. So here, an education divide in politics would mean a landslide for the school leader side. Here, it is already more evenly divided, particularly when bear in mind that graduates tend to turn out more. And that overlaps with age. Graduates are already, by some margin, the largest group in every age group under the age of 50, while school leaders concentrate in the oldest cohorts. So those age divides you see in politics are also overlapping with education divides. How is all this cashed out in terms of recent voting behaviour? Here I'm showing you how each seat has behaved in the period from 2015 to 2019. So the two general elections since education became really salient against the share of people that the census in 2021 found had degrees. There is a very strong negative relationship for the Conservatives. So they have made up lots of ground here in the seats with the fewest graduates. You'll see 20, 30 point increases in vote. Over here, where graduates are the dominant group, they have been going backwards since 2015. Um, in, in fact, on average, in seats with 40% of graduates or more, the conservative vote in 2019 was lower than it was in 2015. Meanwhile, the Liberal Democrats have done exceedingly well against the conservatives in the seats where they're second place to the conservatives and there are lots of graduates. You'll see 20 or even 30 or 40 point rises in Lib Dem support over the past two election cycles. The more graduates there are 
In a Tory held seat with the Lib Dems in second, the, the bigger the change in that it does, the more they are closing the gap. And that has very important implications for the next general election because in many of those seats, you start with towering conservative majorities and much of that has melted away in the previous two election cycles. If you look at places like Surrey and Hertfordshire and Hampshire, you will see double digit swings from the conservatives to the Lib Dems in seat after seat after seat after seat. Average Lib Dem increase in the 46 conservative seats that have 40% or more graduates. 20 points. Average conservative decline, 5 points, which leaves the average conservative majority at 18 points. A swing again of that size would mean nearly all of these seats fall. And in fact, one of the safest seats in this 46 seat group was Cheshire and Amersham. <laughs> so <laughs> you would say this was actually a sort of stretch target. It didn't seem to be too much of a stretch target uh, when it came up. And none of this is static. The share of graduates in these seats is increasing by an average of 0.6 percentage points a year, if you average over the last couple of censuses, which means the electorate in these seats where the Lib Dems are already advancing is becoming steadily more Lib Dem friendly and anti-conservative every year, so long as this education divide stays in place. And that's it for me. If uh, you're interested in this kind of stuff, you can also check out of my recent books available. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't tell Aviv I was putting that. <laughs> uh, good books. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Rob. Um, and so for kind of first response, uh, we are going to go to Miranda Green, who is the Deputy Editor of Financial Times, for some initial reflections. Deputy Opinion Editor, we should say. You've Deputy accidentally opinion. promoted me. Okay. <laughs> <Hooray>. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pretend I am for half an hour. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Rob. That was absolutely fascinating. Although in a funny sort of way, probably what we all in our gut suspect, but to see the see the data on it, proving not only the kind of graduate bias of the Lib Dem message and appeal in such a stark form, but also how that's kind of increasing in those crucial new sort of target areas. Um, I'm sure everyone's going to have loads of questions on the data, so I'll just make a couple of other kind of policy context points. I've been asked to think about the Lib Dems' history with the voters on education matters, and obviously the most uh, difficult uh, example of that in the last few years is tuition fees, and to sort of consider whether that might continue to be a problem, given this sort of massive graduate cohort uh, that the party's trying to target. And there's a couple of observations on that. I suppose it's the context at the moment for the, next, the coming general election is that you've got a prime minister who started, unfortunately, one might say, to notice that education policy is a thing. But his response to noticing education policy is to throw out increasingly strange ideas, <laughs> like let's destroy the A-level system, but I haven't really thought about what to put in its place, for example, which was last, last week's um, rather extraordinary utterance, and his kind of potpourri of, of, of new, new thinking. So I think there's a sort of opportunity for, um, for for the Lib Dems as well, because the, the Conservative Party seems to have decided strategically, probably because of that graph that Rob showed us of where the Tories picked up so much support in the last few elections in the non-graduate kind of cohort. There's a bit of a kind of government war on the universities. So, I mean, I personally think a bit of sticking up for... Uh, the UK's great institutions, which are in a massive export industry, apart from anything else, which actually have very high standards of both research and teaching, um, would be a would be a kind of good message and a good fight back, and might sort of help mend some of those tuition fee schisms between the Lib Dems and, and the and the voters, which I think are slightly still there. And the reason I I think they're slightly still there is because even though it's sort of, in a sense, long lost in the dim and distant past of the early coalition years, the effects obviously are very present to the families of recent graduates. And, you know, we know, for example, at the FT, that if we write anything at all about student finance, it massively over-indexes. People are incredibly angry still about the interest rate on their graduate loans. And, of course, unfortunately, the costs sort of coincide with younger cohorts finding it difficult to get on the housing ladder 
to the kind of terrible double whammy of being kind of locked out of the kind of middle class dream, which in a sense was always what you were being sold that went with the university education, I think it's fair to say. Um, and also as you sort of get slightly older, it's also sort of comes with a kind of terrible pinch of childcare costs. So I think there's a sort of weird, I don't wish to borrow the language of Ed Miliband because we all know how successful his messaging was, mm. but you know, there is a sort of squeeze middle class middle actually. And I think the tuition, the graduate debt factor is part of that. So I just think the party needs to be sort of a bit aware of that. What interests me also about Rob's amazing research is that I wonder how much he thinks it kind of overlaps with some really interesting findings of um, someone I know he works with very closely, Professor Jane Green at Nuffield College in Oxford, who last year, was it last year? I think it was last year, had some really interesting work on people feeling financially, economically insecure across the electorate and the extent to which that affects their voting choice. Now, the really interesting thing about that research is it wasn't about whether you were in poorer socioeconomic groups or wealthier socioeconomic groups. It was about whether you felt economically insecure. And it really, really was very widespread and she could show that it affected your voter choice. So I think actually if you map that on top of Rob's findings, even the idea that you know, the HE system's kind of in crisis and people don't feel that even getting a degree is a, is a passport to a comfortable life, in a funny sort of way, reinforces that tendency to, to move away from the Conservatives. I think if I had my time yet, because I know I always talk too much. Okay, great. Um, so I think that's kind of, that's kind of, in, kind of interesting. Um, on the kind of wider topic, I would just sort of have a note of caution here. This is obviously really encouraging findings for the Liberal Democrats' current electoral strategy. I do think that for a number of years since Brexit, the Liberal Democrats have run the risk of not looking like a truly national representative party. And in a sense, this, is draw this research is drawing attention to a divide which is a very regrettable divide in British society, which is the haves and the have-nots, the knowledge haves and the have-nots, the educational haves and have not have-nots. When you map that onto Brexit and the kind of pro-European nature of, of the Liberal Democrats, I think effort has to be made to work out what the Liberal Democrats have to say to those people who are shut out. And I actually think that's a really, really important thing for the party to think about. I know that we're focused on, a, a, you know, that the party is focused on a general election and on where to pick up the seats and these very useful cohort of growing graduates in target seats. But what about everyone else? Because we all share this, these islands together. And I think that's actually something the party really, really uh, needs to think about. And my latest sort of insight into that is I've been making a film for the Financial Times about education reform, specifically maths. Why are our maths results so bad comparatively in this country? And what came up from that is that almost everything you try to do in this country, if you create two tiers, they map the socioeconomic divide and the class divide. And, you know, even on, on that one tiny piece of policy we were looking at, we flagged up the danger of doing the same. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of uneasy. I'm sort of, in, on, one, on one sense, sort of happy for my Lib Dem friends that Rob's message is so optimistic in terms of the electoral... Uh, the elect electoral prospects and the target seats and all the rest of it. I'm also slightly depressed um, at the idea that the Lib Dems haven't got that much to say to, to the other the other bunch of, of, of our fellow citizens. Thanks, Miranda. Um, and now I'd like to move on to, for a more political perspective, um, to Jane Dodds, uh, leader of the Welsh Liberal Democrats uh, and a member of the Welsh Parliament for Mid and West Wales. Well, thanks very much, Borida. Dear Hawariana, thank you. Good morning. It's just good morning, I think. And thank you very much for the invitation to be here uh, at this panel. It's great that you have, uh, thank you, invited somebody from the devolved nations because we do get left out a bit. And as you'll know, in Wales and Scotland, we have total control over education. There is no influence from the UK Parliament at all on our education system. So the Welsh Government um, has the power over education, health, the environment, and 
just about to take on a whole uh, new slug of uh, areas as well. So it, I just really wanted to give you a quick kind of, this is what Wales looks like in terms of education and young people, if that's all right, because you may or may not know. Uh, so Welsh Labour have run Wales for the past 24 years. Um, we were very lucky in the last parliament, parliament before I, I uh, have been elected in, where we had uh, the education minister, who was Kirsty Williams. So Kirsty Williams was our education minister for Wales, a Liberal Democrat, uh, up until uh, 2022. Uh, and now we're back to Welsh Labour. And, uh, you know, Welsh Labour keep getting in every time. So there is no change. The Welsh Parliament is... Uh, divided up into 60 members, um, 30 of which are Labour, um, and uh, 29 of the opposition, and that's Plaid Cymru, the National Party, and uh, the, the Party of Wales, uh, stroke the Nationalist Party, and the Conservatives. And then there's me, one. So I hold the balance of power. So if Welsh Labour wants something to go through, they have to get my vote. Um, there has to be a majority if the opposition want Welsh Labour to stop something, then they need my vote in order to stop it. So I, I can be everybody's best friend and I can be everybody's absolute prime enemy. Um, just very quickly, what we have in Wales, um, which I think is slightly different from England, and it does form the basis for me about you know education and our young people, our children and young people, we've got a massive pupil deprivation grant system. So that's about ensuring that schools have far more funding um, for our poorer pupils. Uh, Kirsty rolled out something called the 21st Century School Programme. Yes, that meant we had new school built, and that means we don't have the problem with RAC. So actually, we've only got one school which was temporarily closed with RAC because almost all of our primary schools and many of our secondary schools are newish. So that's really positive. Um, we are introducing free school meals for all primary school pupils. That's part of the, what we call the cooperation agreement between Plaid Cymru and Labour. So every um, primary school pupil is getting, will be getting free school meals. And that's a, a universal offer. We've had the new Welsh curriculum as well rolled out, which is a really different way of teaching. Now I'm not a teacher or educationalist, uh, but it's around themes. So each term, the whole school get one theme. For example, refugees. They do geography, history, maths, English, Welsh, poetry, literature, art on refugees. So it is a, a real significant change in the way the Welsh curriculum is delivered. And teachers tell me that it's very positive, that they actually, they enjoy teaching it and the children enjoy learning it. Just a few other little bits and pieces you may or may not know. Wales has got a universal basic income pilot for care leavers. Uh, 600 care leavers are being paid £1,600 a month, which is pitched at the uh, living wage for two years. Uh, so that is, I think, fabulous, and I'd like to see it everywhere. Uh, it's going to be evaluated next year. It's been evaluated by Cardiff University. So that's every care leaver in due, who is... 18 in June 2022 is on the scheme for two years. £1,600 a month, which uh, £400 a week, doesn't matter whether they work, study or whatever, that's what they get and that's been rolled out. Um, and then just in terms of our grant system or our um, way of funding, education is very different. If you live in Wales and you've got a Welsh address, you get a cost of living amount given to you, which is actually more than... Um, doesn't matter, the rich, poor, everybody gets the cost of living payment um, to every single undergraduate. Um, and that's extended to graduates and um, people on part-time courses. And in Wales, I believe we have the highest number of postgrads and part-time graduates across the four nations. Um, we also have the apprenticeship levy, of course, and the skills wallet for school leavers. Um, Challenges, right, that, that they go in a number of ways. I mean, not uh, surprisingly, we have a massive challenge with young people leaving Wales. So actually, we don't have as many graduates staying in Wales as we would like. What's that about? Lots of things. We're a massively rural area. I represent Mid and West Wales. I, 
uh, you know, sheep outnumber the number of people I represent by about four to one. Are they graduate sheep? Well, but yeah, there's a massive issue for us, but it's there for rural areas. However, people do come back. I came back. I left Wales, came back. Um, people do come back with their families to have a different way of life, etc. Um, second homes, massive issue, and the language as well. So if I was to say that what's perhaps not been built in here for Wales, the biggest divide we have, or one of the biggest divides, is language. If you are a Welsh-speaking graduate, you are more likely to vote Plaid Cymru, of course, for the Nationalist Party, than you are if you're an English-speaking graduate. So where we have to work as Liberal Democrats is to get those Welsh speakers and talk to them about our Liberal Democrat values. Uh, they're all pro-European, of course, uh, and Wales, as you know, voted out in the uh, Brexit referendum. Of course, that's massively changing now. Um, many people in the agricultural industry, um, you know, have a different perspective now on um, the EU. Um, so I think I'll leave it there and we come back to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jane. Um, before, so I'm going to throw open to the audience in a couple of minutes. So do think up some sharp questions, both either on uh, the, the data that Rob's presented or on the wider implications for politics, policy and, and the Lib Dems. Um, but just going to pick up a couple of things from themes from Miranda and Jane's and uh, ask you for your thoughts on those, Rob. So from, from Jane, um, it was a little bit of stuff around national identity in, in, in the developed nations. But can you say a little bit more about how this plays out uh, outside England um, in, in the developed nations and how the education divide uh, operates there? Um, and to pick up Miranda's point, so, so I mean, actually both Miranda and Jane started with education policy. Is education policy actually important? Are we talking, we're not talking about students, we're talking about graduates and how, how far do they care about education per se, as opposed to national identity and Brexit um, and, and all of the other issues that you raised? Yeah, I mean, a great question. I mean, on the first one, I think one of the interesting things about what's happening with education and the, and the, and the Liberal Democrats is there is a chance, perhaps a risk, that uh, it ends up shifting the center of gravity electorally for the Liberal Democrats in a way that could make life harder for them in the developed nations because there is a much older liberal tradition, the liberal tradition that goes back to you know, Charles Kennedy, Lloyd George and so on, which is the Lib Dems as a party of the uh, non-conformist Celtic fringe. They always did better in Wales, did better in Scotland, did better in the Southwest. Um, and in England particularly, a lot of that was uh, you know hit hard by Brexit, and if they continue to advance in the way that they have in the last couple of elections in the sort of arc around London, you could end up with a party where a large majority of the Westminster MPs are all being elected in the London Commuter Belt, and that could have big impacts on the image and culture of the party. And so, to guard against that, I think it is going to be important for the devolved parties to pitch a rather different tent, as it were, because the education divide is rather less significant in terms of support in the devolved nations than it is within within England. And then on the second question of education policy, it's certainly true that a lot of this is more fundamental than any particular policy priority. It is about social identity, social values, it's about core elements of how people see themselves, which incidentally is one of the things that makes Brexit such a a tangled web is that that's ended up becoming part of a, the core aspect of how people see themselves as well rather than just being a policy debate. But education does also inform policy preferences. Graduates are unsurprisingly particularly keen on university as a solution to the world's problems and we see that quite a lot in uh, graduate dominated debates about education policy and so on. Um, but um, I think also uh, graduates are keener on greater investment in education across the spectrum. So there, there is a kind of win-win solution here. If, if you propose policies that are about investing in people's skills and education, the, the rising graduate electorate sees a kind of values interest in that, whereas bases on the other side of the device see a direct economic interest. In that. So you can end up building quite a strong coalition based on rather different arguments, which comes back to what about James insecure. So these are relatively secure 
voters often, but so they don't feel necessarily secure because of debts and so on, and therefore they have an affinity with voters who are both objectively more insecure, but uh, feel similarly in subjective sense. Um, and because we're, we're the Social Market Foundation and because we are mildly obsessed with uh, vocational education and further education colleges, I remember um, your analysis split up level two, so school leavers and graduates, I think it was, what was level six that you yeah. used. What about everybody else in the middle? And I'd, I'd be pretty interested in James' thoughts, given that part of the direction of travel in Wales has been towards integrating um, further education and higher education and breaking down the barriers between them. Um, so Rob, do you want to say a bit about politics first and then? Sure, yeah. Policy? So the intermediate levels between, you know, 16 and graduate, they tend to fall in the middle, actually, on most of these divides. So they're in between graduates and schools. But it's not like it's a continuum all the way down, though, because if you look at GCSE level voters versus voters of no qualifications at all, there's no difference between them. Sure. And then if you look at undergraduate degree holders with postgraduates, postgraduates are like the most politically weird and distinctive. <laughs> They're like really, really progressive on absolutely yeah. But there's not very many of them. Uh, whereas A-level voters, they tend to be more liberal than, than GCC voters. And actually, if you plot the census data, they're also a group that's steadily grown over time as well. That decline in sort of 16 or less, it sort of splits halfway between people who stay to 18 and people who stay on to university. So you're right, a big tent coalition on the liberal side of the education divide would be one that encompasses people in the 18 bracket as well. And Jane, did you want to say a bit about it? the, yeah. the, 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 the missing middle uh, that's often overlooked? Yeah, and I just really wanted to make a comment as well um, around, you know, what we're talking about, because for us in Wales, and I, there's not there's nobody here from Scotland on the panel. Westminster is not <laughs> sorry, <laughs> um, Westminster is not the big win for us. It is the Welsh Senate. Um, that is everything in terms of power and control over people's everyday lives is managed and ruled and governed by the Senate. So for us as Welsh, well, for me as a Welsh Liberal Democrat leader, you're, you're bound to hear me talk about how important it is for us to get more Senate members rather than more MPs. Of course, we want everything all of the time. Um, but uh, we, you know, if, if you look at education, it's all about the Welsh Parliament. And actually, you know, we may get we may get some MPs. Let's hope we do. But really, our aim is to get more Senate members, so we we influence it. And I still come back, and this applies to further education and higher education as well. There is this divide between Welsh speakers and English speakers. Still, uh, I mean, it's a it's it's clear in terms of how we need to be looking at our politics, but also in terms of. Um, higher education. We are we are a nation which is small, but we are integrating our 18 plus, 16 plus offer so that it is a combination of, of vocational and study. Uh, our universities are really well known, of course, um, but our challenge is that people don't stay. People will either come into Wales to study and go back uh, to England or like me, they will leave Wales. So. We have to find a way of holding on to those young people and to find uh, a way for us as Welsh Liberal Democrats influencing those who are Welsh speakers um, and shifting them away from the nationalist view, which actually is based, which is going to be an interesting one in terms of the next general election, because I think a lot of young people, uh, so if you look at Yes Cymru, which is a massive young people's movement uh, around um, around nationalism and independence, where that was based was in the anti-Johnson narrative. They, they loathed him, didn't we all? And therefore, they really wanted independence. But actually, I think it's going to be very different the next time around. I don't think we're going to get that degree of passion uh, because actually, I think Welsh Labour and UK Labour are going to be working quite well together and they're going to be looking at how we can advantage Wales better. So, you know, that's going to be a really interesting narrative in terms of the next general election when Keir Starmer, or as somebody I heard it say in Wales call him, Steer Karma, gets into power. And that will be an interesting dynamic between Mark Drakeford and Keir Starmer.
Do you want to comment on anything before we open to audience? No, I mean, I suppose just to say that um, given my sort of earlier raising of, not, I wouldn't call it a red flag over this graduate bias in the Lib Dems, I think it's sort of going a pale of pink mm -hmm. as the conversation sort of develops, because actually I think it's very interesting what Rob said about building a kind of coalition of support for really positive proposals about healing the nations. I say nation in the widest sense, Jane, you know, the UK's educational divides. If you can sort of come up with things that, that, that help across the education piece, and I think you're really, really so right to flag up the enormously important area of you know, vocational skills and technical education, which has been sort of Cinderella sector for so long. Um, yeah, so I'm sort of increasingly cheered by the fact that actually this data might show us ways to uh, to form some sort of common platforms across across those two segments. Great. Well, hopefully you've been sharpening your questions. The gentleman at the back has been very eager to come in, so I'll let, I'll let you go first. Thank you very much. Well, I just want to ask you a question. Two days ago, I went to the John Curtis uh, evaluation of polls, and uh, I was very depressed when I came out. <laughs> Yet here I, I get an uplifting message. Uh, his argument basically was that the Conservative vote collapse was going to mainly to Labour. We were very limited uh, uptick. So, why is the disparity between the two researchers that seem to be around the same level? Is it because yours is very focused on the, as it were, the Lib overseas, that they're going to bring the graduates? What, why is that disparity between the two messages, between you and the BBC? As well? <laughs> um, I'll take a couple more and then uh, and later here. Yeah. And really on, on the student question, because obviously these are people we need to try and attract. And um, uh, I have to say, if you talk to current students, they're not really that bothered about tuition fees. It's the cost of living that's the mm -hmm. problem. So I, I love the Welsh mm -hmm. idea. So I think those are the sort of policies we ought to have. But also we need to combat the myths about tuition fees. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've heard people confidently say, since the Liberal Democrats introduced tuition fees, um, which is, of course, it's Labour. Um, uh, and we're certainly not responsible for the interest rates now. Um, so I don't think we need a, a better message for students. You know, I've got too many colleagues who say it's no point even talking to them, they all vote Labour by it. From what you're saying, they're the people we ought to be talking to. Uh, just a comment on that. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, gentlemen here. Thank you. Two quick questions for Rob Bagel analysis, please. One is your data inevitably tells a story about conservatives, which is quite linear. Um, conservatives in the last few years have not been linear. Um, and I wonder if you have any sense you've made off your data how attitudes of your graduates might have changed since the advent of what you might call the post loop conservative leadership yeah. in the last few years. <laughs> secondly, um, uh, you took it, your analysis in terms of education level. I wonder if you could call the extent to which it is about education and about class, how much extent which is about class. To put that differently, one of your charts showed um, the great expansion of the number of people going to university, um, presumably broadening the socioeconomic base of that. Do so-called new graduates behave the same way as so-called old graduates? Great. A few things for you to come back on there. Okay. <laughs> shall I, shall I go, uh, go through those ones first? Then? Um, so um, on the disparity between uh, John Curtis's analysis and mine, that always makes me uncomfortable because I work with John a lot. <laughs> so I really like to be at odds with him. I suspect I know what's going on here, though, which is John is always a very cautious in his interpretation of polling and doesn't go beyond what the polling says, which is generally a good uh, approach. It's problematic though when it comes to the Lib Dems because national polling is, is peculiarly uninformative for the Lib Dems, given that Lib Dem prospects rely very much on strategic contexts that voters aren't thinking about very much when they answer national polls. So I do think it is an important development that much of the change we've seen in the past couple of years is directly from conservative too late, but it is not that there is a national advance for the Liberal Democrats. However, I also think it's very likely that in the seats where you have Conservative first, Liberal Democrats second, much of that shift away from the Conservative will actually end up channeled into the Lib Dem column, as it indeed has been in the last couple of election cycles, with university graduates in particular being the kinds of voters who are most likely to do this. So I think the reason is John doesn't like to make that kind of speculation based on the polling. He says, here's what the polling is. You're going to have to decide what it means. The national polling suggests you've got a challenge. What I'm saying is, once voters start focusing on the local, that challenge becomes an opportunity. So that's how I would reconcile uh, the two. Um, the middle question was students, was it? Uh, it was the, oh, I was looking at, yeah, sorry, students and cost of living. Yes, sorry, I was getting too much about yeah. John Curtis, which I should do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, students and the cost of living. I, I think that is 
absolutely right. Uh, and of course, there is this, um, as has been discussed on the on the panel, there is still this sort of bruise uh, from the uh, tuition fees uh, issue um, that I think still resonates with students and younger graduates that they don't necessarily see the Lib Dems as, as looking out for university students' economic interests, which is, of course, really seriously at odds with where your electoral interests lie. So it does, to me, make very logical sense for the Liberal Democrats to make a substantial offer to that particular demographic on those kinds of economic issues, so that economic issues interests then line up with social values. The tricky thing, though, will be credibility. Because of what's happened before, you've got a lot of work to do rebuilding trust with that group. And then the final couple of uh, questions, linear versus non-linear. Well, here again, I'm going to um, uh, uh, take on the voice of Joan Green, who's already been mentioned. She did some uh, presentation recently where she was describing how you can think about the current political dynamics and the kind of post-crazy, I think you called it, era, uh, in terms of two things, tides and tribes. So the educational alignment we're seeing right now, that's a kind of tribal alignment. Brexit alignment is a tribal alignment. What has happened in the past couple of years is a tidal shift. So the tide has gone out for the Conservatives everywhere, amongst all groups, at roughly equal rates, leaving these kind of tribal disparities intact. So they're losing with everybody, roughly equally, and that means, as it were, that, the, the, that more of the landscape is being exposed for them, but the hills and valleys in the landscape that are the products of tribal alignments, those are remaining roughly the same. So they're not losing more with graduates and they're losing with non-graduates. They're losing equally amongst everybody, which seems to be because this is what, you know, my colleagues would call a valence crisis or a competence crisis. People just think they're doing a really bad job. And there's really not very much variation across different demographic groups in the degree to which they think that. Uh, last question as well is new versus old grads. Ah, oh, new versus old grads, yes. Well, the short and class. So the yes. short answer is, yes, I've done a whole bunch of number crunching controlling for other kinds of socioeconomic variables, and education remains really important even when you control for people's incomes, their social class, their subjective social class, um, their housing status, and so on. So this is something that is on top of those, although those things are overlapping, this is on top of them. And I tried splitting it out by cohort, and um, in general, except for the very youngest cohort, where basically everyone seems to be like massively anti-Tory regardless of their background or experiences, which seems to be potentially a socialization effect. They have been socialized into the crazy era and drawn their own conclusions from that. Amongst older cohorts, this education divide is pretty much the same everywhere. Though, of course, the implications of that vary because there's a lot more graduates in the younger cohorts than the older cohorts. Jane, thoughts? Yeah, no, I don't have many thoughts um, and additions. The only the only thing I would say is that we in Wales are trying to push all the time that it was a Liberal Democrat cabinet member who introduced the changes, for example, around payments to students being at the cost of living uh, level um, and introduced the new curriculum. So we badge that all the time as a Liberal Democrat um, policy um, and that Kirsty Williams was a Liberal Democrat in the cabinet. Of course, that came with um, huge um, difficulties as well for Kirsty, being a Liberal Democrat member. She had to vote with the cabinet, collective responsibility, etc. Um, but we badge that all the time. We badge the changes in Wales, the positive changes, as Liberal Democrat because it was a Liberal Democrat that brought those changes in based on our values. And I, you know, I can't comment for anywhere else, but I think we have to be talking about how our students. Uh, how are, how are our undergraduates going to be managing? Because they can't take on this level of debt. It's 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 extraordinary what's happening, and it and it isn't happening in Wales. We're not seeing that happening in Wales. So I think it's a really good policy to to pitch for England, uh, as well as thinking about how how do you support the people um, in terms of their learning and in terms of them being enthusiastic to learn. And to develop more, and the new the new world curriculum will be something I hope people can learn from going forward. Do you mind if I take a few more questions? I'll come to you first next. Thing. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Uh, should we get a few more questions? It's the back. I mean, thank you, really. We're all discussing the liberal impacts and social mobility. Some of you are already in borough weather and therefore is elected at any level at all. Mm -hmm. um, and two questions to Rob, really, based on my 
working in university locally and in schools, uh, not selected schools. One, how much account have you taken of ethnic differences in graduates? The worst performing school students are white Brits, boys and girls. And that goes right through the system. But obviously more and more of our graduates are not white Brits, are Brits of other backgrounds. And the next question, have you looked at that? Because I think there may be some different thoughts. And the second is more and more people do a degree apprenticeships which don't have the same financial disadvantage, going back to what Grant was saying, as conventional degrees, because they're earning as well as learning. Uh, and our university does also. Have you looked at the difference in attitudes between those who are clearly thinking degree pay off student loans and those who are actually an increasing number who are not in that category because they're from the beginning of their higher education now more they're more financial support. Um, question there? Question there. Me? Yes, yeah. Um yeah, hi. Um I'm from Centenary Action and one thing I wanted to ask about was Global Institute for Women's Leadership did some recent research about um, women and the sort of gender gap between voting intentions and the sort of shift towards being uh, women voting more left leaning. And so I wondered how that um, mapped onto what your what your research was, Rob, and, and whether you'd sort of seen differences between men and women in your in your research. Uh, thank you. Just to bring it back to education, I work at the Open University. I'm sure we'd all agree that obviously education isn't, a, you know, isn't an end point at the age of 20, 21. So therefore, interested if we do have policies and incentives to really support the case for lifelong learning. And certainly at the Open University of Wales, we are you know, delighted with you know what the, the push that has been uh, from a Welsh perspective. But if that was to be more broadly and particular from an English point of view, what changes might we see there? really do start to support people to really invest in lifelong learning and give them the opportunity to do so. Um, Brad, do you want to come on those questions or any other ones? Um, yeah, so, I mean, I don't actually know, to be honest, what the, what the LEDEN policies are on on, uh, on 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 sort of lifelong learning beyond which what's actually been taken up much more in the political mainstream. I mean, lifelong learning and a lifelong account seems to actually be sort of fairly mainstream with Tory and Liberal parties as well, uh, Labour parties now as well, which is actually massive progress, yeah. I would say. So I'm really delighted by that because actually when the Lib Dems were talking about a lifelong learning account, it sort of sounded a bit eccentric and they'd be wanted to follow up on the conversation, but now it just seems to be a sort of fact what we need in the landscape. And also, you know, what happened to the Open University was terrible, actually, and the abandonment of part-time learners after the coalition reforms was really, really bad. So I think it's incredibly important to listen to Jane on what's started to work in Wales on that. And I would agree with her, you know, saying that part of the answer to what you tell, tell your pissed off students on the doorstep as well. Um, degree apprenticeships are really important, Simon, yeah. I mean, you know, and, and they work brilliantly. I have to tell you that sort of anecdotally, the only people I know who are on degree apprenticeships are the sons and daughters of very well-informed leaders of think tanks. I mean, they, they are still quite small scale. If that was a genuine opportunity across the piece for young people, but of course, you've got to find the employers to fund them. And as the government's finding with its T-level vocational qualifications at level three, unless you've got employer buy-in and the businesses to support them, you can't actually get these schemes off the ground to scale and that that's the problem but they are very important i would just like to go back for one tiny second to a previous question which was just this thing about um what, what you know what to tell the students and and, and the Lib Dems being blamed on tuition fees because i think rob is really right about this i think you have the, the Lib Dems have to come up with some sort of proposition for that cohort that feels really hard done by as it looks at the cost of living and its debt payments mm. and its rent money going out and thinks well when is this going to come when is this going to come right for us mm. and of course it's it's wildly unfair to blame the Lib Dems I mean I'm so old as an education writer that I was covering the 2003 bill where Tony Blair only got it through by two votes you know and it was an incredibly exciting kind of day in parliament and even Labour's own MPs didn't understand that it wasn't an upfront fee 
you know, that is how bad the kind of myths around tuition fees are. I'm sure we all know families where they still think you have to find upfront money. So, I mean, you're absolutely right. There's a horrible load of old myths, but, you know, Martin Lewis is very, very good at, at doing myth busting. I mean, maybe you should just print off some of Martin Lewis's stuff to give to people when they, you know, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dwell on the topic of justifying the Lib Dems decision, <laughs> definitely. But I agree with Rob. I think there needs to be some proper sort of consideration of why those people, what would it be, like under 40s, under 35s? you know, being shut out economically. Put Martin Lewis on your uh, election week, that's really good advice for any party. Yeah, although, he's very, <laughs> although he's really litigious, so don't do it without his consent, because he gets pissed off when people do that, because everyone tries to do it, yeah. Uh, Rob, um, yeah, uh, ethnic differences, gender gaps, uh, degree apprenticeships. Yeah, another great set of questions, and so it's reassuring when you've been running your statistical models for people to ask about the things that you have remembered to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so on ethnic differences, well, they're, they're, I mean, ethnicity remains one of the strongest predictors of political behaviour in Britain by, by a large margin. So there is obviously an ethnic difference in terms of ethnic minority versus white um, graduates. Um, but even when you control for that, and even within each group, you will see that um, graduates are more on the left than non-graduates, but ethnic minorities tend to gravitate a lot more to Labour and less to the Liberal Democrats. So that, that's still evident. Um, then in terms of the gender gap, um, yes, gender is also like recently, Rosie Campbell recently did a great report on this, has become a predictor of, of vote choice with women going to the left, uh, and that is particularly graduate women. And of course, more women are graduates, more women go to university. Uh, than men. I think within each 18 year old cohort it's about 58, 57% of women do and under 50% of men. So there's a gender education gap which is then informing a gender political gap. But again if you split it out by men and women or if you control for gender as a confounder you see that the education effect is evident in both genders. But these things interact in kind of complicated ways with the graduate population becoming more majority women, then an education divide also starts to become a gender divide, not because of anything that's specific to gender, but because of things that to do with education too. On degree apprenticeships, I did panic for a second because I was like, why is there not a variable for that in my data set? And Miranda has provided the answer, they're not big enough yet, I suspect, for the, for the BES to ask about it, although I will ask the team whether or not they could put something in on that, because um, it would be interesting to know, and um, because it is a very different set of economic circumstances. And, and finally, on lifelong learning, from an academic perspective, and please forgive me for doing that at a party conference, talking about chin, you know, chin stroking academic, this would be really <laughs> fascinating because one of the things we really don't fully understand is what produces this education divide. Mm. Is it what's going on in the lecture hall? Is it what's going on outside the lecture hall? Is it some combination of both? Is it the trajectory it puts you on in your life? And if people are taking up education at very different stages in life, it enables us to sort of separate out the effect of getting that education from all the other things that tend to be smushed together with it currently, with everyone just doing their degrees at exactly the same time and exactly the same stage of life. So it's going to be really fascinating for all of us uh, <laughs> to find out what that means. Um, and it could have unpredictable consequences on, on how education was. Well, as we'd expect it to have a liberalising effect, but it could be a bit different. Um, I'll sneak in a couple more questions than that, so everyone's round up. So, lady there. Um, yes, I was about to ask about old people like me who did their degrees in their late 30s, I said, in my early 40s, uh, married to an academic with children. You know, I seem to be recipient of all your influences. <laughs> Um, is that I don't think we looked at that particular cohort. I basically tried to mind for a with a lot of other people of my age and gender. I think it'd be interesting. So, so yeah, you, you said expansion of lifelong learning would be interesting, but mm. we should look at the people we've got now who are already have uh, studied later in life. Uh, that would be kind of cool. Uh, I'd have to see if we've got a variable on when they did their degrees. Yeah. And again, that could be something 
to ask about. Um, I would say if you're someone who is yourself a university graduate and you're married to an academic and you have two academic children, you're getting pulled about as much as, well as it's possible to be pulled in a kind of graduate liberal direction. <laughs> I was raised in a very, very conservative household. I'm the first person in my family to engage with women or special for Christian women at the time. So actually, I'm not from that family. I'm going to be the last one. Oh, great. Thank you. Right, so oh, my question, still a bit for Jane and for Robert Scott. I know now in Wales, 16 and 17 year olds are going to be able to vote. And I just want yeah, to sort of reflect on what, what you think will happen along those lines. And, for Robert Law, how do you think that will reflect in terms of the data going forward, way, especially in Wales? And if that was done UK wide, what would it be like that? Then I'll do that. So, thank you. Brilliant. Jane, I'll ask you to come in on that yeah. and then maybe to kind of sum up your thoughts. Of course. So, just to also just some comments on the other questions. So, 16, 17 year olds vote turn. Uh, they they could vote in the last set of elections, but the turnout was very poor for 16, 17 year olds. So we've got a big piece of work to do in order to get those 16, 17 year olds out to vote. In the new curriculum, there is more there around a civic responsibility um, and the need to be involved in democracy. So that is is kind of uh, being upped uh, quite substantially. But it is a difficult one. If anybody here has the answer to how you get 16 to 17 year olds out to vote, please let us know. Um, mm. Of course, in the parliamentary elections, it didn't help with the fact that people had to produce their own voter ID, um, and that'll be the same in the next ones. But for Wales, we've actually abolished that. Um, can I just say a few other things in my plug to come and live in Wales? Um, <laughs> in terms of women, um, I think I'm the only one on the panel who regularly knocks on doors, perhaps you do uh, outside of your other jobs, but. How many of us have heard that retort from a woman or a young woman, you know, I don't vote or I leave it up to my husband or my brothers or whatever. We need to be doing that right there on the doorsteps. Another plug for Wales, 2026, we will be the first nation to have totally PR elections. So we are introducing um, proportional representation into Wales in 2026 in our Senate elections and 50-50 gender quotas, which will be legislated. So our parliament in 2026, will have to be 50% women, and that will be the, the first step on a journey for protected characteristics for our Senate. We were the first one in the world in 2003, where we had 53% of our elected officials were actually women. Um, so we're doing quite well in Wales. And just to say something about um, OU, thank you. We are uh, doing well, I think, in the OU. I live in Powys. Uh, we have no university. Apart from, we do have the, a university, we have the Open University, and we need to plug it more, because people in rural areas, that's the way they study, and that's how they become graduates. So we need to be really plugging that. My final, my final sentence is really, you know, um, I hope you've got a real feel for what we're doing in Wales. I hope you've also got a real feel for what's different for us in Wales, because we are a different beast to England and Scotland. Uh, everything for us in education, is based in the Welsh Parliament and all our decisions are based there. Um, so if you want to know more about Wales, come and talk to me. In Scotland, I think having a, an independence referendum probably helps engagement of 16 year olds, but you might think the medicine is worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rob, do you want to answer those questions, sum up? Yeah, sure. The the I mean, on 16 and 17 year olds, uh, again, there's, that would be very interesting uh, from a kind of pointy-headed academic perspective because then you would be able to see how people who go on to become graduates behave before they've gone to university and then see like how much of their distinctive behavior is kind of baked in by their family background and stuff so that would be fun for us as not it? but then in terms of its political implications i think one really important potential implication if you can solve the turnout problem which is a tricky one is 16 and 17 year olds are living in very different places to 18, 19, 20 year olds. You know, young adults tend to end up living clustered together in big cities, which tends to result in their votes often being cast in very safe seats. 16 and 17 year olds are generally living with their parents spread all over the country. So that adds a lot of extra younger voters into seats where often there are fewer younger voters where the kind of political climate is really determined by older voters. So it could have some really interesting implications in terms of political geography, albeit only if you solve the turnout problem. Um, and then in terms of a, of a general sum up, I mean, 
I think it's been really good actually to have a discussion with somebody from uh, the devolved nations here because perhaps I hadn't given enough thought to that issue of how particularly for a party like the Liberal Democrats, education does interact with other tensions over devolution. So within England, it is very likely that the next election is going to pull the Liberal Democrats southwards and Londonwards in terms of where they're likely to succeed or look like succeeding in the future. But being pulled southwards and Londonwards is like the worst thing that you can do if you're talking about Wales and Scotland. So it's going to be really important for them to find a way to make clear that just because they've got more MPs from the southeast of England doesn't mean they're just of the southeast of England. Mm, round up your last words. Um, no, I, honestly, I'm just, I'm just really grateful to Rob for, for sharing his research, which, you know, I think as I said at the beginning, is, is things that we all sort of felt in our gut about Liberal Democrat support, but to have them laid out so starkly. I'm also really grateful to Jane for sharing those really detailed examples of how the education landscape can be made to look really different, and 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 why that's kind of an important mission. But thank you very much for the invitation. Brilliant. So, thanks everyone. Thanks, thanks to Rob for the research and post presentation. Thanks to Jane and Miranda for their insights. Thanks to UK and Changing Room Europe for sponsoring the work and the event. And thanks to you for participating. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.